and this work is on what is essentially the optimal algorithm for solving linear systems on a quantum computer in the sense that it has the optimal scaling in terms of both the condition number and the allowable error. And this is using a form of the discrete adiabatic theorem, which can be used far more generally for the, the speeding up algorithms which are based on the, um, the continuous adiabatic evolution for Hamiltonians. So this was mostly done in the Macquarie group here with um, my postdoc Pedro taking the lead on proving the theorems. There's also Yuval, who's in the group at the time, who's now moved to UTS, and Dong An, who you heard from earlier, and as well as people at Google. And I'll mention as well, there's the archive number at the bottom there. I'll give that at the end as well. So in terms of motivation for why we care about solving linear systems, the idea is that on a quantum computer, you can get exponential speed ups in large systems of the, um, linear equations, and these can be obtained in particular from discretizing partial differential equations. So you might use this, for example, for solving flow problems or for solving for electromagnetic scattering cross-section for, say, a radar signature of a plane. There's also applications in machine learning. Uh, more generally, if you're looking at adiabatic algorithms, these are used for solving for ground states, which can also be used to encode solutions to other problems. So, for example, there's discrete optimization algorithms that are based on adiabatic algorithms. So, for the general formulation of quantum linear systems, we are aiming to solve for x, which is some vector on some very large dimension n, when you're given a vector B and you're also given a matrix A, which might be, say, a sparse matrix. And typically what is assumed is that you're given an initial state B where the amplitudes are given a, as the, the components of that vector B and you're aiming to get the same thing for the solution X. So the final state X is essentially like applying A to the minus one as an operation on that initial state B. Now, because this is not giving an explicit listing of the components of X, typically what you need to do is work out some way of obtaining global properties of the solution from sampling from that state. So it's a bit more restricted than the solution you'd get classically. But in terms of the speed up of these things, it's always exponential in the speed up in the dimension N. So the quantum algorithms always have a logarithmic complexity in N whereas the classical algorithms are always polynomial in N. And this is a common feature of all of the quantum algorithms. So when you're comparing complexities, you typically ignore that um, scaling with N and instead look at scaling with the condition number and the allowable error. So the condition number is just a ratio of maximum and minimum singular values. So it's gonna be something that's large for a matrix that's close to singular. And this is something which governs complexity both in classical algorithms and quantum algorithms. So in the original algorithm by Harrow, Hassidim and Lloyd, there was a complexity that was going like kappa squared, but they also proved a lower bound, which was strictly linear scaling in kappa. So there was clearly a wide possibility for improvements there. And there was a whole lot of improvements made in a long sequence of algorithms over the following years. And what we've provided here is essentially the optimal scaling the algorithm in the sense that it is the first one that's strictly linear in kappa. And not only that, we have a complexity which is scaling as log one over epsilon, which is also known to be optimal in epsilon. So there's also the question of what's the combined scaling of the two things together. So you might ask, for example, it, should the optimal scaling be a kappa plus log or should it be a kappa times log? And this is something which has been come across in the case of Hamiltonian simulation where the, the, the optimal complexity has actually got a plus there. But it turns out that in the case of solving linear systems, the minimum complexity actually has a times there. So our algorithm is the actually optimal in terms of the scaling of both of these the parameters together. Now, an important feature which was found to speed up these algorithms uh, from about 2018 was that you can encode 
this as an adiabatic problem. So that was what uh, gave a lot of the speed ups there, making things close to linear and kappa. But there's a difficulty there in that when you're doing the adiabatic algorithms in the usual way, where you have a continuous evolution under the Hamiltonian, when you're trying to actually encode this into gates, you need to encode a time-dependent Hamiltonian evolution. So the most efficient known way of doing that is with the Dyson series, where you basically expand up to some order k, and you have multiple integrals over the Hamiltonian with time ordering. And typically, to get to allowable error epsilon, you're going to need to take kappa to be logarithmic at epsilon. Now, when you're applying this to the case of solving linear systems, you also get a factor of log k there. So you end up with a log kappa over epsilon overhead, which is why that was obtained in the Lin and Tong work. Now, what we're proposing is instead to use a discrete adiabatic evolution. So this is essentially based on the idea of translating a Hamiltonian into a quantum walk. So this is originating from, say, ideas of linear combinations of unitaries where you can take an operation A and write it out as a linear combination of unitaries, UL, and you can implement that operation on a target state psi if you can perform a preparation on a control ancilla and then do the controlled UL and an inverse preparation and then measure that control as being in the state zero. And if you have successful measurement, then you would be applying A to the target, but you can also consider a more general type of scheme where you have just some more generic operation U, which is done between the a, ancilla and the target system. And then the idea is that if you measure the control as being zero, then you will have applied A to the target and so that's what's described as block encoding. So when we're presenting these algorithms, we're just assuming that we're given some way of block encoding the matrix A, and we're not actually going into any details of that. And so all our complexities are in terms of calls to that block encoding of A. Now, when you're going to try and create a walk, What's done is you just put a reflection off on that ancilla instead of doing a measurement. So this is what it looks like if you were using a linear combination of unitaries to create a walk step. And this is what it would be for a more general block encoding. And so you end up with a unitary operation W, which has eigenvalues, which are related to the eigenvalues of the original operator. So this is something which was originally proposed for a more efficient way of simulating Hamiltonian evolution. It was later realized that if you're interested in just measuring eigenvalues before energies of a Hamiltonian, then you can just uh, do phase measurement on this walk step and then invert the function to give you your eigenvalues. Now, that really gave very nice speed ups for quantum algorithms for quantum chemistry. So I've been doing a lot of work on that. But in this work, we're essentially applying the same insight to the case of adiabatic algorithms. And so whenever you wanted to do a adiabatic algorithm for a Hamiltonian, you instead do a cubitized version of that Hamiltonian and do a discrete walk for those cubitized steps. And that's what gives the speed up. Next, I'll talk about how you actually encode the the problem of solving linear systems into an adiabatic algorithm in terms of the Hamiltonian. Now, generally what's assumed is that you're given some projector for the initial state B, so which was encoding that vector B. So we also assume that we're essentially given some encoding of this projector with unit cost. So that projector can be used to construct an initial Hamiltonian H0, and then you can use a block encoding of the matrix A as well to create the final Hamiltonian. And it's easily shown that the final eigenstate of this Hamiltonian are looking like this. So it's actually giving you the encoding of the solution that you're aiming for. Now, when you're looking at the 
adiabatic evolution, you're going from H0 to H1, and you can look at some scheduling function f of s so that this is starting from zero and going to one. So that's taking you from your initial Hamiltonian to your final Hamiltonian. So you're starting from the state B and going to the solution in the adiabatic evolution. Now, in order to choose that function, typically what's done is by looking at the gap. And it turns out there's a nice solution for the gap for this Hamiltonian, which is looking like this, which has an important feature here that you have a one over kappa here. So what this means is that as the condition number becomes large, the gap becomes small, and this is more difficult to solve. And the schedule F is chosen such that its derivative is going like some power of the gap. And typically that power P is going to be, be somewhere between one and two. And for this gap, you can solve for the F of S. Uh, you don't need to remember this particular the f of s, except that the important feature of this is that it has this parameter p, which can be between one and two, which we'll be going back to later. There's also the question of how to address more general a. So that original one was for a, a, a positive definite a and emission. So you can expand the Hamiltonian with an extra qubit to address the general Hermitian case that might have negative eigenvalues. And then you can expand it again to address the non-Hermitian case. And we have an alternative way of doing this with just a single ancilla. Now, the important feature of these is that they are giving something similar for the gap, but it's not the same. So it is actually a new formula for the gap that looks like this, which is a bit more difficult to work with. So, the, typically, what we do is we just use this the lower bound where it's the original gap divided by root two. And this can be used to basically take results which are worked out for the restricted case of A and, and just do minor changes to get a corresponding result for general A. Next, I'll talk about the form of the walk. So Dong An already talked about this quite a bit, but the idea is that you have these walk operators which are obtained by cubitizing Hamiltonian. And you have a parameter here, which is similar to the parameter that you would have for the Hamiltonian. So that you have a W of something, which is where that something is going from zero to one. And you have a total of capital T steps here. And you index these steps by little n. So you have n over T is giving you the argument for this walk step W. So then your overall operation is a ordered sequence of these w's starting from w0 up to the final w. And of course, in the adiabatic evolution, you're aiming to start from an eigenstate of the initial w and go to an eigenstate of the final w. Now, this exact evolution is called u. We also consider an ideal adiabatic evolution with a superscript a. And this is adopting some similar notation as the paper of Dranov, Killen, Dog, and Seiler from 1998. And that paper was deriving a form of discrete adiabatic theorem, which was showing that the error between the ideal adiabatic evolution and the actual evolution as the, the sequence of steps of the walk was upper, it was upper bounded by order one over capital T, the number of steps. Now, this is very nice, but it's not enough at all to give us results for the quantum linear systems problem, because what's important there is what is the scaling constant. So that's what I've written as theta here. So when you have an adiabatic theorem, you're expecting the error to be dependent on the gap so you need to know how that scaling constant theta is depending on the gap. And in turn, the gap is depending on the kappa, the condition number. So you need to know that to know how this complexity of the algorithm is going to depend on that condition number. So this is, means that what we've needed to do is to completely rework the discrete adiabatic theorem in order to work out what the dependence on the gap is. So there's a few uh, parameters which I'll explain here, which are needed to understand what's the um, 
the theorem means. Uh, one of them is, first of all, that our successive walk operators, these should be the, uh, relatively close. So they, intuitively, you're expecting that as you're going from one walk operator to the next walk operator, the difference of these is of order one over the number of steps. So what we uh, do is say it's an upper bound where we have a C1. So remember, we're needing to get all of these constants in this uh, discrete adiabatic theorem. So we say that this is a C1 over T rather than just saying it's order one over T. We also need to consider a second difference. So this is basically the difference at one time step minus the difference at the previous time step. So this is like a discrete, the analog of a second derivative. And then we also need to have that this second difference is upper bounded by something which goes like one over T squared, and we have a constant C2. So what you end up seeing in the final algorithm is a C1, which is like quantifying the size of derivatives, and C2, which is like quantifying sizes of second derivatives. And I should also mention as well that in the that what we actually give is a C hat, which is actually a maximum over neighboring steps, which is just needed to simplify things so that the expression isn't too unreasonably complicated. The next thing that we need to look at is the gap. So as compared to looking at gaps for a Hamiltonian, where you just have a real line and you just have a single gap between low values of the, the low eigenvalues and high eigenvalues, what you have with a walk operator, because this is unitary, is you have eigenvalues on a unit circle in the complex plane. Now you have a desired set of eigenstates, which um, typically this would just be one eigenstate, but more generally the adiabatic theorem can allow a group of eigenstates, which is indicated in red here, and a and the rest of the eigenstates, which is indicated in the green. And because this is on a circle, you have to have two gaps the, on either side uh, between these two sets of eigenvalues. And another feature of this is that you can't just look at the gap for a single a walk step. You need to look at it for neighboring steps as well. And this is because you could have a pathological situation where you had the groups of eigenvalues moving like this, for example. So here you can see that this gap is actually moving by a large amount. So an eigenvalue which might be in the green region for this step would be in the red region for this step. So this is something which isn't allowed for the adiabatic theorem to work. So to quantify this condition, what we look at is actually the groups of eigenvalues for three successive steps. So this is at step uh, S, which would be like a one like an n over t. Then at the next step, then at the next step, and you just take the unions of these groups of eigenvalues and look at the gap between these unions of groups of eigenvalues. And one more thing which I'll mention as well is that. Again, you need to consider gaps over neighboring steps just to simplify the expression. So this is what this um, the check mark or, or inverse hat over the delta means. So once we've defined all of these things, we can look at our form of the discrete adiabatic theorem here. And we also have a more complicated and tighter version in the complete paper. And you'll see here that you have some terms at the beginning, which are just for the beginning and the end. So these are actually analogous to what you get with a continuous adiabatic theorem, where you have derivatives of the Hamiltonian at the beginning and the end, and you can see that these are essentially corresponding here and here. And then the sums that you're seeing in these, the theorem are uh, corresponding to the integral that you would get with the continuous adiabatic theorem. And you can see here, you've got a first derivative squared, and you can see here, you've got a second derivative, which is analogous to your second difference indicated by the C2. There's also a couple of extra terms which don't have any analog in the continuous case, but these turn out to be smaller. And when we're looking at the asymptotic scaling, these will disappear 
Now, we'll go over the general method to prove the theorem, and this is following along the lines of the Janov, Kelman, Donk, and Seiler paper, except we're going through and working things out in much more detail to work out that gap dependence. So there's a few um, operators that you would need to define to understand what's going on. So first of all, there's what's called a wave operator, which is essentially your actual evolution and then the inverse adiabatic evolution. So if your actual evolution is close to ideal adiabatic, this wave operator is going to be close to the identity. So instead of looking at the norm of the difference between these two u's, you can look at the norm of the difference of this omega for the wave operator from the identity. And that's what is actually done in the method. And you can also consider what's called a ripple operator, which is just like one small step of the wave operator, which is indicated here. And then what's called the kernel function is like the difference of that from the identity. And these are all used to write an expression for the wave operator that looks like this. So this is like a discrete version of the Volterra equation. And the important feature of this is that you have that this omega is equal to an identity minus a sum. So if you can show that this sum is small, then that's going to show you that your omega is close to the identity. And that's the general idea. But showing that this sum is close to zero is not that easy. So uh, if you just try using a triangle inequality on each of the terms in the sum, it won't work out. You won't get a tight enough bound. So what you do instead is introduce a resolution of the identity in terms of being a sum of projectors onto the desired eigenspace and the undesired eigenspace. So that's the P and Q. So the P naught and Q naught are just these projectors at the initial step. And you're introducing these before and after that K operator. And then you can use the triangle inequality and divide this up into what's called diagonal and off-diagonal parts. And for the diagonal parts, these are relatively easy to bound. It's the off-diagonal parts which are hard to bound. So these are the ones where you have two different projectors. You have a P naught and a Q naught. So the general method which is used here is that you are taking your, um, the, the, your uh, kernel K and writing it out in terms of these operators. So these U, I minus V dagger and U, these are corresponding to the kernel from before. And then you're looking at a summation by parts formula where this identity minus V dagger is just written as an X. And uh, this V in turn, in turn, that's described in terms of a walk step and an ideal adiabatic walk step. Now, what this is you, um, giving you is then a B, which is a boundary term, and an S, which is a sum term. So that's involving a sum. These are very complicated formulas, which so I won't give them here, uh, except to say that there's an additional difficulty that you need to... In, rather than just giving the operators that have been defined so far, also define an X tilde, which is defined in terms of a contour integral. And this contour integral has a resolvent, uh, R, and you can also use this contour integral for defining projectors. So to get a projector onto the desired eigenspace, which is indicated by the red dots here, you can do a contour integral of the, the um, resolvent around a contour, which is indicated by the black line here. Now, this is uh, useful when it comes to trying to bound the norm of the differences of successive projectors. So when you're looking at successive projectors, what you can do is then look at the eigenvalues for two successive steps of the walk. And to bound the difference of projectors, what you want to do then is have a contour that's threading through the gap for both of those steps at the same time. And that's why we need to consider these unified regions of eigenvalues because this contour needs to thread between them. And essentially what you're gonna find 
is that the size of this contour integral is bounded according to how close it's getting to these eigenvalues. And so to make this the bound as low as possible, you want this to be far away from these eigenvalues. And you're going to end up getting a, a size of this bound that's inversely proportional to the gap. And this is what you get for the norm of the difference of projectors. So you see there that this is inversely proportional to the gap, which is indicated here. And they basically, we have to apply similar ideas like this in a very long chain in the derivation to finally give us our results. And I'll next talk about what we actually get for this when we're applying to the particular case of the linear systems problem. And this is for P equals 1.5. So remember P, this was quantifying our, this was a parameter in our scheduling for the adiabatic approach. So it was supposed to be between one and two, and we've just here taken it to be 1.5 on the principle that somewhere between, halfway between one and two should be close to optimal. And you can see here that there's a whole bunch of things where these are terms from the adiabatic the, um, theorem, where we then worked it out for the case of the, the quantum linear systems problem and given complexity in terms of that condition number kappa. And there's three of these which have higher order upper bounds and the leading order upper bound is kappa over T. And that gives you a upper bound that looks like this, where you have the upper bound on the error is some fairly large constant times the kappa over T. And what this means is that if you're interested in working out the scaling of T, which is the number of steps with the condition number kappa, you can say, okay, I'm going to allow some error for my adiabatic algorithm, plug it in on the left-hand side, solve for T, and then I'm going to get a complexity T, which is proportional to the condition number kappa. And because we have just the kappa here, no logarithmic factors, this means that the number of steps is strictly proportional to the condition number kappa. And I should also mention as well as a, a little caveat at the top here, this was for A positive definite and permission. Now, rather than reworking the entire thing for the general A case, we're just using this factor of root two for the bounds between the special case of A and the general case, which gives a somewhat larger constant factor in here. So it's not a very nice constant factor, but at least it's still got that strictly linear the, uh, proportionality to, ca to kappa. Now there's another feature of this, which is coming from our cubitization, which makes things a little bit more difficult. So the idea of cubitization, one of the a, uh, problems is that if you're taking a eigenvalue of your Hamiltonian, it's turning into two eigenvalues of the cubitized step. So basically, if you have eigenvalue H, it's turning into eigenvalues that look like this on the complex plane, which means that rather than just having a single region of desired eigenvalues, you have two regions. Now, it is possible to rework the entire adiabatic theorem to account for multiple desired regions of eigenvalues, uh, but it's simpler to just say, okay, we're going to consider one of these as the desired region as compared to everything else and show that that's preserved in the adiabatic the evolution and then do the same for the other part of this desired region of eigenvalues. So the actual eigenvalues that you have are looking like this, where the K here would be a eigenvalue for the Hamiltonian, and you're getting these, what I'm calling here a plus and minus eigenvalues, which are combinations of that with some orthogonal garbage state. But if you have a positive superposition of the plus and minus, then these are just giving you the zero K. So that means that this is eliminating the garbage state. And this is basically what you start with in the, the adiabatic algorithm. But when you're talking about adiabatic algorithms, you can say, okay, I've shown that the plus state is preserved. 
I've shown that the minus state is preserved. What about the phase between them? Because if I pick up a minus sign between these two states, then at the end, I'm going to cancel out the solution and get the garbage state. So what I need to do is preserve that phase factor in the, the adiabatic evolution. So this is an additional thing which we've worked out and proven that this phase factor is actually preserved here. And as a further thing, which is that there's also some orthogonal degenerate eigenstates that we need to keep track of to make it all rigorous. Okay, so the next part I'll talk about is some numerical testing. So if you remember before, we had a fairly large constant factors of 5,000 or 15,000 in this ADB theorem for solving the linear systems problem with the adiabatic method. But we had a actually a much more complicated and tighter version of the adiabatic theorem in the paper. And what you can do is take the operators that we have and gaps, exact gaps that we have for the quantum linear systems problem and plug that into that very complicated formula and numerically work out what the upper bound on the error is. And that's what's been done here. So you see here on the left that as you're increasing kappa, or various values of that parameter p, you're actually getting that strictly linear behavior in kappa, but you're also getting a much nicer constant factor. And on the right here, you can see actually as a function of p, it, it is quite good for 1.5, which is what we were using before, but it's actually optimal for 1.3. And the constant factor that you end up getting is about 600 as opposed to 5,000 before for the a uh, case of positive definite and admission A. So that's about a, a factor of nine times better than the theorem, which is indicating that with some further work, that theorem can be tightened in, tightened in terms of the constant factor, but it isn't too unreasonable. So the, there is um, a actually sort of still a fairly large constant factor. But of course, in terms of the actual error, when you they look at the actual adiabatic evolution, this is still just an upper bound from the theorem, the actual error is likely to be a lower constant factor still. Next, I'll talk about the filtering. So this is an idea from the paper of Lin and Tong, where the idea is that you're using an approximate adiabatic evolution and then filtering the final state in order to get accuracy epsilon. So remember, we're aiming for some relatively high precision epsilon. So what they're using is quantum signal processing, which has the drawback that you're computing rotation angles in a very long sequence, which is tends to be difficult uh, computationally. So what we're proposing is instead just directly using a linear combination of unit trees. And you can work through what happens with a direct linear combination of unit trees, and you find much the same result that a Dolph Chebyshev window is going to be optimal for removing the non solution states. There's a, another a advantage which has been put forward for quantum signal processing, which is that you're just using a single qubit as your control, whereas with linear combination of unit trees, you have a whole long sequence or a, a, a whole lot of qubits that you're needing to use for control. So what I'll present here is actually a way of reducing this to just two control qubits. So what you do here is, first of all, you expand your control qubits from a binary representation to a unary representation. Now, this might seem to be counterproductive because you've just exponentially expanded the number of qubits. But when you're looking at the preparation, you have a much simpler preparation where it's just a sequence of controlled rotations. And so you have controlled rotations starting from the top going down to the bottom. You can invert those for the inverse preparation. And so you're just sort of working down the qubits in a line and you're working from the top to the bottom at the uh, preparation, then for the controls, but then from the bottom to the top here. But when you're looking at the inverse preparation, you can also reverse the order. So you're again working from the top to the bottom. Now, what this means is that now you can actually rearrange your, the operators so that it's only actually working on two at a time. Now, 
the, uh, so what you have here at the beginning is you're just operating on those first two A qubits. Then you're measuring out one of these qubits and introducing a new zero densilla here, and then operating on those two qubits, uh, qubits two and three. And at any one time, you're only needing two of those control qubits. So this means you only need to con uh, two controls. But as well, there's a further advantage is that in the case of a failure, you're going to be measuring one of these ancilla qubits here as zero instead of one. Now, if there's going to be a failure, a lot of the time this failure is going to be picked up early. So if you are picking up a failure early, it means that you can just discontinue the procedure, re-prepare your initial state and start your filtering again. And in comparison, the quantum signal processing is needing you to go all the way to the end before you're checking for success. So in terms of the average number of steps, this actually gives an improvement over quantum signal processing because if you're looking at the average number of steps, then in the cases of failures, you're on average going to be picking that up around halfway through. So you are requiring one more qubit, but then it's the, on average fewer steps, at least by a constant factor. Okay, so putting all this together, we have the overall algorithm with a complexity which is going like kappa times log one over epsilon. And this is in terms of a complexity in terms of calls to block encodings of A, as well as preparation of B for a projector. And the overall procedure is to construct a quantum walk from the block encoding of A and the a state B as well, then use the discrete adiabatic theorem for solving for the solution with some fixed precision that can be relatively large, say one half. And that complexity is strictly linear in kappa with no dependence on epsilon. The epsilon dependence comes in in the filtering step where you have a complexity which is going like kappa log two over epsilon, at least in the case of success. In the case of failure, what you can do is just re, redo the entire adiabatic uh, evolution. And since you're saying that you want to have precision one half for that, on average, you're not needing to repeat that more than about twice. Okay. So finally, I'll just mention a lower bound, which was worked out by the Aram Haro and Robin Kathari, which is um, a similar scaling, except it has this extra root D factor, because this is coming from the question of how to solve for sparse matrices, whereas what we're considering is not sparse matrices, it's just general block encodings. So in terms of the kappa and epsilon scaling, this is optimal. And so, but then if you're looking at the sparsity scaling, the, if you were to just do a standard block encoding, this would give you linear and D complexity. So then you would have a result which is not optimal scaling in D. Now, this is an interesting open question and is quite similar to an open question in the case of Hamiltonian simulation of getting complexity, which is going like root D. And there was some very nice work by Guang Hao, which was showing that you could get root D up to some rather relatively large logarithmic factors in the case of Hamiltonian simulation. And in principle, you could use something similar here, except those logarithmic factors would actually be fairly significant in terms of the kappa and epsilon, so we would then, mean, then be finding that the, well, the logarithmic factor that we just uh, got rid of for kappa would be um, they actually swamped by these extra logarithmic factors. So there's an interesting open problem there of how would you do this with a root D complexity without picking up extra logarithmic factors. Anyway, just to conclude here, what we've found is the fastest possible quantum algorithm for a quantum linear systems problem in terms of scaling with the condition number and the allowable error. And we don't consider the sparsity. And this is, a, a, other than the sparsity, which we're not considering, this is matching the lower bound for the complexity. And a, there's 
methods that we've introduced, which are usable far more generally. And one of these is the idea of taking a adiabatic algorithm for a Hamiltonian, cubitizing that Hamiltonian and using a discrete adiabatic evolution. And this can be expected to give speed ups for a whole range of other adiabatic the, um, the algorithms as well. The other thing is this neat method of reducing the linear combination of unit trees to just use two ancilla qubits, as well as having this early flagging of failures. For future work, there's uh, clearly going to be some scope for improving constant factors because in our full theorem, we have sort of in the thousands constant factors there. And the, uh, at least from our numerics, it's the, the tight bounds can be significantly smaller than that. And also there's the open question of how to achieve optimal scaling in D at the same time. And I'll just finish by pointing out our archive paper at the bottom. Again, thanks.